had no expectation with respect to my interview with James Coburn. I thought of him as a fine actor with an amazing voice. Then he started speaking to me about his meditative device, which involved the use of gongs. So we did a radio show, which involved his voice and the sound of the gong. And it resonated beyond anyone's expectations. How are you? I'm fine, man. How are you? Everything is working. Yeah, great. It's always so difficult when getting into these subjects that we're going to talk about tonight to, to find a spot, to find a, a hook or a way of beginning our communication. Let me be very specific. What is it that you're looking for in life, Jim? What is it that you are personally seeking in terms of your own being? My aim is, it has been for, oh, I guess a dozen years or so, is uh, to try to become more conscious. Uh, there are many ways of becoming more conscious. I mean, the, the idea of consciousness itself, I mean, I assume everyone feels that they are conscious. Well, I guess we are to a certain degree, but to become more conscious, to fulfill a potentiality that uh, we all have to a greater degree is my aim currently and probably will be for my next three or four incarnation. Why? Why do you feel the desire to do that? Why would you not just kind of lean back and enjoy it? You're obviously in a position to do just about anything you want on a, on a material, overt level. What is it that, that makes you want to go beyond speedboats and Cessnas? Well, it, we're obviously for a reason. I uh, haven't discovered what the reason is yet, but uh, I'm, I'm looking. I'm a seeker after the truth. I mean, it, it excites me to uh, think about what the mysteries behind life are and uh, how maybe to get in touch with some of them and maybe turn myself on to a degree that I don't know anything about right now. I find uh, that I feel very stupid in uh, what I'm relating to people on uh, other levels. I mean, we have several friends, and I brain pick them. They come over to the house, and we we rap about uh, all the various esoteric subjects that there are, and hoping that some of that will rub off. Uh, a new idea will come about, uh, something that will touch my soul. Maybe uh, somebody can lay a magic hand on my head, and I'll become completely enlightened and all of that. But that's all just hope and fun, and I uh, enjoy those people a lot. But I really don't feel that any of them can give you anything. All of the systems work. I find that if you practice any of the, you know, esoteric uh, systems, they all work. I mean, if you, uh, your approach is through the Zen means, uh, that works. So Spinsky, Gurdjie, uh, that all works. The Sufis work. Even Catholicism works if you know how to get in touch with the magic. Uh, Judaism, they all work, but they're only part of it. They're only really just a very small fragment of the totality. And uh, we're all sitting here shining like dull diamonds with, uh, you know, like one or two facets uh, blasting away, and we think that that's all we are. Well, there, there's more light there than we're really aware of. And that's simply my, my quest is to uh, find out what turns those lights on and to turn them on. Like it's one thing to wake up, but another to face the day. Ah. You said something interesting. You were like going through that litany of things that do work. And, and I think your line was, it all works if you can touch the magic. Uh, speak to us a bit about what you mean by that. Touch the magic. Well, it, it seems that in most of these, uh, the magic, the, uh, when, I, when I think of magic, I think of the fire behind something. Uh, in most of our Western religions, it seems that uh, the magic has all been uh, rooted out. I mean, they had the witch hunts and everything, and uh, I don't know the dates behind all of these things, but the magic was taken out of the Catholic Church, or at least set aside someplace. Maybe uh, there's a, a great magician sitting somewhere in the Vatican that uh, has access to all of that knowledge, and he performs his little rites there. Uh, the Tibetans have magic. I've seen them perform all sorts of I, I went to a yoga conference last, that was just, just a year ago, last Christmas, three days before Christmas, in New Delhi. 
Really? It was the first scientific yoga conference. <laughs> and it was like all of the sadhus came down from the hills and all of the great teachers from all around. A lot of the uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, the Western, you know, guys who uh, are interested in mind and so on, uh, were all there, and they were all exchanging their wares. <laughs> and uh, at the, I guess it was the last day, the day before the last day, I guess it was the second or third day of the conference, there was a Tibetan named Guru Lama who did a puja, puja to the slaying of the ego with his, he had a, a little drum, it looked like an hourglass with two little tassels that hung down from the side and he twisted it and when he twisted it the, uh, the tongs would spin the little balls around and it would go bloom, bloom, and have a little tone on the drum, two tone drum. Ah. He had a thigh bone trumpet, a <laughs> bell and a little doja which is a, a little, they call a thunderbolt and he chanted. And it was uh, an hour puja. And he had 300 people in this classroom completely on his trip. Everyone <laughs> was just so focused and it was beautiful. And in the midst of this, a flash uh, hit me over the head. It was like I was like I got hit over the head with a hammer. And it's only happened one other time with a Sufi in Tangier. But uh, this was totally unexpected because I really know very little about uh, the, the Tibetan yoga, the Mahayana yoga, the Maha, Mahayana Tibetan yoga. And uh, afterwards I invited him up to my hotel and he was Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sweetheart. He was just so beautiful. And he was telling me that uh, he was building, they, since they'd moved down from Tibet, they, uh, they were having to build their the new lamasari. Uh, that's great. Uh, well, uh, how much does it take to build a lamasari? He says, a couple of thousand dollars. <laughs> I thought, two thousand dollars, you can build a whole lamasari. <laughs> so I laid some bread on him, you know, like, and he was really, really thankful for that. And uh, so he went up, and I understand now that they've got the lamasari almost built. Great. And I, I, that was really beautiful because he came over to the house and we'd recorded the, uh, the puja and we played some for him over the thing and he sat there listening to it with. Uh, a great smile on his face. I, I you know, I, I couldn't communicate with him in any way except just kind of look at him and yeah. smile, and he yeah. would he would beam back this beautiful <laughs> smile. That would happen there. He ate meat, you know. We had a Chinese dinner up there, you know, like and he drank some wine with us, and uh, was really a, a great human being. We had uh, a really marvelous time. Well, anyway, I mean, I, I kind of diverse got off on the on the subject of, uh, but see, like like he has some magic. He turned something on inside me that I still remember that's still there. He made me more conscious of that moment by shocking me through this magic that he was performing. And I'm sure everyone at the conference felt that, that, that same thing, if not probably to a lesser degree because it hit me so hard. It just snapped me right around. More, um, more about the magic. More about the magic because I think that was, that was taking us somewhere and, and I'd like to explore that for that, that magic. Well, it, it seems that the Tibetans... Uh, have not given their magic up. They're, what they're doing now is spreading it about. Now, to, to identify it, uh, I can't do it, but he could, and there are many that come down from it, from the mountains, and uh, they, they live in a very a rarefied atmosphere, most of them. They're all human beings. They, in fact, they think that we're very magic because we can make cars. <laughs> a great thought. Yeah, I thought that yeah, was beautiful. It's you know, really like nice. the, they See, we have a lot of magic that we're completely unaware of. We have a, a Western technology that uh, we've developed that uh, people uh, tend to put down because it's being used so badly. But they think that that's real magic. Now, somehow we can get together with these people. I mean, like the people that have the real knowledge that turns into magic. Magic, in my definition of it, is just something that can transform. It's alchemy. It's, uh, it's all of those things. That witches have magic. Uh, the black magic, they call it. Well, magic is magic. It depends on how it's used. If you're an mm. evil man and you do evil things to people. And there are, there are some... Uh, some good men. If I, if I could quickly insert that that um, that you're of course referring within the framework of a magical abstract discussion as opposed to making a specific allegation. Oh yes, yeah, certainly, it. absolutely. Just so we'll both not be called to court together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, the, the the magic. 
The magic. The magic in uh, in Zen, for instance. I mean, yes. like you, you're familiar with that. Yes. I mean, you're familiar with that transformation that takes place. Uh, that some of the Zen people have it. Some of them don't. Some of them give it. Some of them don't. Oh, it. It's a question of uh, being able to not understand it so much, but uh, be open to it. I mean, it doesn't seem to be so much the thing that you do, it's something that you don't do, so that it'll hmm. infect you with its uh, glory, which it really is. I mean, like it's uh, a shot of liquid consciousness. It's a chemical thing that ha happens on a... Uh, an electrochemical basis. I mean, the Sufis go through a different, ho a whole different thing. I, I'm, the only other time this has ever happened to me was uh, uh, a great Sufi who I worked with for a brief period of time before his death in Tangier, uh, Iqbal Ali Shah, Indra Shah's father. Uh -huh. He wrote the books, the sure. Sufis and all sure. of those things that have been coming out. And uh, one day we were sitting in his thing and we, we, were, we were going through... Uh, what he called seances. It was just meditative exercises in which we kind of went out of our ourselves and floated around the skies while he was filling us full of this energy. And you could actually see it in your, you know, with our eyes closed, we were seeing the, the thing. And uh, are, are you talking actually about an out-of-body experience? Or yeah. You are? Well, it's... It, it, it's uh, well, it's, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's only in the imagination. I don't know. But I was able, I was, from, from the vantage point that I had, I was able to look down and, and see, see, yourself see myself there. and the three of us, my wife, Beverly, and uh, uh, Mushet, and myself sitting there. And this triangle of blue light was passing between us, going right from heart to heart to heart wow. to heart to heart to heart. And... Uh, one day when we were doing this, the very same thing happened. When I was up there watching all of this, a flash, it was like an explosion going on, boom, and I was down again. And uh, I asked him, I told him, Whew. that was a very heavy dose. That you mean. So, well, yeah, he laughed at me and he said, yeah, well, maybe I gave you a little bit too much. Son. And I thought he was. Can, can one receive the magic from someone who is not conscious of giving it? Uh, and we could say you mean like an accident of some kind, you know? Well, I think everybody uh, kind of has these accidental uh, no, magical experiences. I don't mean quite accidental. It's it's like it's it's similar to the old question: Can you love someone who is incapable or refuses to love you in return? Can you get magic from someone who is not aware of their ability, not aware of their powers, even refuses to come to grips with it? Have you gotten those kind of contact highs from from people who are not into any of the stuff that uh, the, of which we speak? But you know that Catherine Kuhlman? Yes. Uh, she, she claims she doesn't know what, what happened. She doesn't have any idea. She just goes out there and preaches the word of God, and, and uh, it all comes down. You I did mean, the like Dick Cavett show with her a few weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, and she was very interesting to observe. And, uh, did you she, get she it she has, Well, see, the, 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 this is kind of like those mediums that you hear about all the time, you know, right. that uh, people can, well, those, they're... The thing that happens when they just become a vessel for something else, they have no control over what they do. They just seem to have an opening that they uh, can somehow turn on, and through them comes this other being or so on. It's a great expression. They become a vessel for something else. That's yeah. magnificent. Right. So uh, it, now that's, that's what she claims she is. She's simply a vessel for m some other force. I mean, and she calls it uh, Jesus Christ. Yes. And uh, because that's the thing she's the most familiar with, I imagine. If she was living in... India, she would call it Shiva or uh, Krishna or uh, whatever. But uh, I must tell you something interesting about about Catherine Coleman. Um, I did a special on her once here months and months ago, and I went to the Hollywood Palladium, where she was having a miracle service for youth, mm -hmm. and the, and she packed the place in twenty minutes. With most of them were eighteen year old white male, long haired San Fernando Valley kids with drug problems. Yeah. And again, she walked around and did the laying on of hands. Hundreds and hundreds of people, everyone she touched, collapsed in the arms of professional catchers who stand behind her to catch these people. And every now and then her arm would rub up against one of the catchers and he would go out. And it happened with every single person she touched. I was there with a, a tape recorder. I would have gone out wow. myself. And one of the, the remarkable things about faith healers in general that it's, it's so easy to write off the Catherine Coleman's and the Oral Roberts for 
psychological reasons and the rest of it. There was an experiment done in Chicago recently with 50 white mice, all of which were injected with live cancer serum. And there is a very, and I can document this story for people who send me postcards. And there's a very well-known faith healer traveling through the South who they brought to Chicago. Of the 50 white mice, whoops, let me just, of the 50 white mice injected with the cancer serum, the faith healer placed his hands over 25 of the mice. The 25 mice who he touched lived. The 25 mice who he did not touch died of cancer within a matter of 14 days incubation. And I thought that was <laughs> trippy. My guest is James Coburn. Jim, yeah. how do we bring it all home? I mean, the folks who are listening to us right now who say, yeah, all of that sounds really marvelous and mystical and beautiful and poetic, but how do we relate that to daily life? How do we relate that to the one-to-one -one experience? How do we do it right? That's the whole point of the whole thing. Uh, as I said, you know, like all of this stuff works, and it depends on what your aim really is. If you want to be a saint, then you start out and make yourself a saint. I mean, uh, Milarepa did that. You know, he had to go through all the numbers. Uh, but how do we apply all, all of this stuff that, you know, like is coming out now? Uh, we have more access to information, mm -hmm. and uh, there seems to be a teacher around every corner, and everybody wants to turn you on to some new technique that will, you know, raise you up out of this morass that we seem to find ourselves in. Well, uh, the, 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 the steps are very simple. First, you have to take that first step of uh, deciding, oh, just, just kind of taking that first breath and say, uh, well, like I am here for some other reason than to be a mechanic or a uh, race car driver or something else. I mean, like there's a purpose for my existence here. I'm a little protoplasmic unity that uh, needs regenerating uh, every so many hours and uh, I can only seem to bring myself up to a certain point and uh, after that uh, I uh, kind of collapse and fall down and uh, lay down and uh, smoke a joint or uh, you know have a glass of booze and get out of it and go to sleep mm -hmm. well to perpetuate that desire I mean, some kind of technique is necessary, and you have to go to somebody who knows how to give you a technique. I mean, and, you know, if you have a priest, you go to a priest and say, well, listen, how do I bring myself up? Or if you're interested in the, in the yogi magic, then you go to, uh, uh, well, there are a lot, of, a lot of yogis around. You go to one of those guys, or you go to somebody who uh, had, has had experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, the psychedelic experience has turned a lot of people on to, uh, you know, other levels of perception. And uh, so you make a step. You say, okay, I'm going to be a, uh, I'm going to find out what Zen is all about. So you, you read all the books and uh, you don't understand any of it. And you find somebody <laughs> who can, uh, uh, you know, the poetry is nice and the paintings are really marvelous. But what does it all mean? And you ask somebody, well, what does it all mean? And they say, that's Zen. <laughs> <laughs> and right. well, which, which is great because yeah. it, it, it shocks open all of those particles that have been crystallized in your head. And you say, I can't think about that. And I say, well, they are. Try, try to uh, associate that painting with the cone and yourself and uh, just see what happens. Nothing happens. Well, try again. Nothing happens. Well, then try a little meditation on the koan. You just sit down and you think about it, or you uh, try to realize it some way. Okay. I mean, no success. I mean, like, it's just a very good thing. Okay, you read a little Vivekananda or Satchitananda, and uh, you read the thing, and maybe you will run across somebody who'll give you a mantra, and you go ahead and you do the thing. And maybe you'll have a little success there. Maybe something changes, something alters. The slightest thing, you think, oh, great. Okay, then you, if you find somebody that kind of uh, does something to it, if it's an emotional reaction, if you can uh, feel a, uh, a, an emotional uh, attachment to this person or to the idea or whatever, uh, maybe you can recognize what love is a little bit more. I mean, and it's all based on love at all. Uh, love is the energy that makes it all work. Whether it's, it's all based on it's love. All, all, that's the energy that makes it work. The rest of it is... Uh, love of, of what? Uh, love. I mean, the understanding of love, and the, it's a sensation, it's a, uh, an understanding, it's uh, a total experience. The Sufis base the whole thing on love, love of man for woman and woman for man. 
that's necessary before any of their magic works. I is that it for you, too? I mean, uh, yeah. is that the core of your experience, oh, love yeah. for a woman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it, I find it very difficult to do anything but appreciate an idol. I mean, I can understand the idea behind it. I can sit in front of it and meditate and hope that it's, uh, you know, like all the attention that it's received from the many ages that it's existed can, you know, maybe shed some light on it. But uh, I, I can't appreciate that. I can't really love that like I can a woman, my wife. Is that, is that experience, the love that you share with uh, Beverly, highest than anything else that you're into or anything else you've ever been through? Well, it... it it is kind of like the, uh, that energy is what you use to raise yourself. Oh, I mean, like, I that's see. the end. I mean, like, if it's not there, you can't manufacture it. You can't say that it is there. So if you it's not there, uh, you have to find another emblem. You have to find an emblem. Uh, Rumi, who was a great Sufi poet, found it in uh, Shams de Tabriz who was a weird old right. dervish who walked around, you know, saying all kinds of bad things about everybody, but who knew. Yeah. And uh, he and Rumi went away and lived together for, you know, like three or four years. And he, Rumi left his whole school behind. And he was, uh, you know, like Magister Ludi. <laughs> and he dashed off with uh, Shams. And they had this fantastic esoteric experience together. Until it really got physically dangerous for them. And then they had to separate and uh, do their thing. But it was an esoteric experience. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people read in a lot of homosexual kind yeah. of numbers and everything. But th there was a love between them that transcended all of that physicality. Now, the, the great thing about woman is that you can uh, have, have a relationship on all levels. I mean, like, in the, you know, like the highest level, of course, is to be completely, totally plugged in mentally, physically, sure. emotionally, and so on, which is really rare. And that's something you, uh, you have to work on. And uh, it's not possible all the time. I think what we all look for is something that's possible all the time. We just turn us on <laughs> and there we are there all the time it's not like that it's like uh, the the breathing in and the breathing out process it's uh, cyclical it yeah. moves and it grows but without that movement there's no growth you got to have that movement so you can't despair when it's not there you place your attention to what on what that makes it come about again L let me just take a break and do some commercials sure go uh, ahead I'd also like to get into the very, very special method that uh, that you use, or one of your methods. In, okay. in you. Just before I do that, um, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't wish, but but I am curious, and, and I'm, I'm sure there are many people listening to us now who are too. Have you taken much LSD? Have you taken much acid? I, I've, I've, ta I've, I've taken uh, acid maybe five, six times. I took it uh, with uh, Dr. Janiger you know, like 1958 or something, when he was uh, doing all the experimentation for the government. And we should also mention that at the time you took it with him, it was legal, so neither of oh, yeah. violating the law. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was really, I, I took it because uh, I wanted to use it as a gauge for my consciousness. You know, I was interested then in where I was uh, on a conscious, what conscious level that I was on. Right. I was into uh, Leo Spinsky and the Gurdjieff. You went to Gurdjieff uh, then? Yeah, well, the work is, uh, permeates most of my, I mean, it was really, a, it's really a, a, a basis, a, a standard that I work from mm -hmm. now. I mean, like, it's always something, because it works really well, practice of the placement of attention. Yes. And uh, the evolution, the, the idea that man is a self-evolving creature, which is uh, basically true, I believe, and that uh, you can do it. Are you glad you took your LSD? I mean, do you think the experience was beneficial for you then, or, or, would, or, or was it nebulous, or would you rather not have taken it? Or No, I think it was, uh, for, for me, it was a very good experience because I went in with an aim. There was no fear. There was no anxiety. There was uh, just a, uh, an experience that I felt that I wanted to have. And uh, uh, Janiger, he was uh, beautiful. You know, he just mm -hmm. said, well, here, you're going up to a certain land, and... Uh, we don't know, really know what it is. Everybody kind of goes up there, and they all come back again. And there's always a little alteration. So, uh, <laughs> and there was a lot of alteration. <laughs> oh well, I remember. <coughs> Hang on just a second, Jimmy. Yeah. I'll take some care of some business. Alrighty. Uh, if you're just joining us, my guest is James Coburn, and you're listening to him over KLOS, Los Angeles, ninety-five point five FM stereo on your radio. My name is Elliot Mintz, and I'll be with you tonight till midnight. 
And in an hour or two, we're going to open telephones, and you're going to have an opportunity to call up and, and of course, uh, offer your thoughts about anything that happens to be in your head. Let me take care of two bits of business, and uh, then we'll get right back to our guests. Gongs. How did yeah. you get uh, involved in gongs, Jim? How did that start? My gong guru <laughs> <laughs> is a uh, beautiful man. He's uh, Dick Webster. I uh, used to live behind the Hamburger Hamlet when uh, I first met him, and uh, we experienced a lot of things together. And he was he was instrumental in getting the uh, aware in going. He was, in fact, he was oh. uh, the inspiration behind Jim Baker. When Before Jim started. Baker, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, they were partners, and uh, 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 Dick wanted to make it a vegetarian restaurant, and uh, Jim thought it would probably be uh, more commercial, and it would, and as it proved out to be right, if the uh, they were in, then it became a very big thing. Well, anyway, Dick, Dick, and I have had a long history of uh, really interesting experiences together, and uh, I hadn't seen him for a long time, mm -hmm. and he was living out in Lancaster in a little, a little hut that he had. He and his old lady, and uh, I drove out there. I just got in a Ferrari, ah. a Ferrari sports car, Spider, short, <laughs> race fast. And I was going to go out there and see Dick, and so uh, my old lady and I got in the car and went out to see Dick in Lancaster. And we walked in the place, you know, and he made us some tea, and we sat down. And I looked over in the corner, and I said, "What's that?" <laughs> and he walked over there and sat down in front of it and played it. And uh, then I went over and played it, and we spent the whole afternoon playing the gong. We didn't say ten <laughs> words to each other. The chicks were in the other room, you know, listening, and, you know. But, uh... He didn't explain anything to no, you? No, no. Well, there's nothing to explain about a gong. You just approach <laughs> it, you sit down in front of it, and you strike it. And then you strike it again, and it's different. Uh -huh. And somehow you're a little different. And then pretty soon you have a relationship. You start having a relationship with that hunk of metal there, that uh, it's like a meditation, because it, it plays itself. I mean, it's just like you're opening the song that it has to sing by striking it. You're opening the song that it has to sing. That's lovely. It's beautiful. And it, uh, it, see, the, the great thing about the gong is that everyone can play it. You just have to sit down and do it, like everything else. <laughs> you know, only you get an immediate, an immediate thing here and here. You know, like I, I don't know if it's, uh, I, it probably n nothing more than just uh, if it doesn't do anything but release the tension and take your attention and place it someplace that's away from the mundane kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I play it, you know, just about every day. Last night, uh, in fact, Alan Watts was over the other night. Was he? He was here two weeks ago. Yeah. We well, this was about this was about a week and a half ago, I guess. Huh. He came. He was doing some, uh, I don't know, lecturing down here or something. Yeah, he's an incredible man. Just beautiful. Uh, well, I played the gong and he chanted a benediction for uh, a, a new Buddha that we had. Oh, uh, a Buddha that we night. had there. We got in Thailand, and it was great. It was just. It was a really great experience. I knew there was a reason why the rain stopped today. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we played the gong loud and loud last night. We did it. Did he chant to the sound of the gong, or did he just get into his own om? No, what he said, he said, uh, just play a steady rhythm on the thing, a steady uh, thing. And I, you know, he was sitting right here, and I was with my back to him. And it was all like, it all, all became a very beautiful thing. It all, it all happened uh, like it... it the gong was uh, really a part of the ceremony. Great. Great. And we all had a great feeling after that. It was just uh, the thing that was really necessary for the, the kind of gathering we had. Well, looky here, Jim. It just so happens that we have one here. We have uh, broken the KLOS Sunday night budget this week <laughs> by <laughs> renting this gong and, uh, and brought it down. Uh, first of all, just for the people who are listening to us and can't see the gong, could you d describe it? Because I have difficulty describing musical instruments. I'm not familiar with them. What are we looking at here? Well, it uh, it's an alloy. It, 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 this particular gong is a uh, is made in West Germany, I believe. I have one very similar to it. It's uh, an alloy. Looks like a little copper and brass, and mm -hmm. uh, it's in three pieces. And it's made from an old formula by uh, uh, from Burma. I don't know where the Germans got this formula, but they ever went down. And evidently, there was somebody who was really interested in gongs and went down there and got the formula and uh, took it back to Germany and started making these gongs. 
I don't know who the guy is that makes them, but uh, I have one. Uh, Dix is just exactly like this. And uh, mine is a little larger. It's about, I guess, what, the, what would that be, 28 inches? Mine's about 33 or 34 inches. When you say 28 inches, you mean 28 inches across? Is yeah. It like, like a high-fidelity speaker? Yeah, yeah. And it's suspended from a rim? Yeah, well, that, that's the, the rack. Right. Generally, it, uh, mine's suspended on a wooden rack that Dick gave me. How much do yeah. they usually weigh? I don't know what the weight of them. I get it really. I get. I guess probably three or four pounds, mm -hmm. maybe five pounds. I have a Burmese gong that weighs probably twenty pounds. It's shaped like a hat, flat, and you strike it, and it sings for about oh, I guess oh, a minute. It'll sing for a minute. I have an idea because we've talked so much about it, and 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 with things like this, the best thing to do is experience it. Let's take a break, play some music so we can set up some stereo microphones behind it. Okay, we'll and see if we can get any sound out of it. And see we what only we have do. that one mallet. That's uh, really... But, uh, Is maybe there anything else we could use it. as a mallet, maybe in the building? Any uh, thought come to mind? I stick? really doubt it. Unless, unless we just go out in the parking lot, there's some shrubbery out there and we could take a <laughs> stick. <laughs> no, what I play with generally is some uh, uh, either timpani mallets or xylophone mallets, soft, soft mallets where you don't really hear the... You know, the the mallets hitting themselves. What uh, the, the mallet that we have here, what, what uh, is different about that than the one you usually use? Well, this is a gong mallet, and it's used simply for striking it, not for playing it. I see. And uh, it, uh, you, I can play rhythms and things like that on it, but you really can't get the texture out of it that... Uh, uh, because you kind of, you kind of get, get, a th get the thing going, and it starts singing, and then with just pressure... On these uh, mallets themselves, as you kind of uh, what would be on a drum, a roll, kind of like a right. slow roll, uh, you build up the sound, and then you, you build uh, different textures, layers of sound. Whang, you accent a little bit, and it picks it up and vibrates throughout the thing. You can, you can pick up these overtones and uh, play on various levels of it, and it's really, it's really a lot of fun. Let's take a break, see what we can find in the okay. building, and come back and do some of it. Okay. We're here with James Coburn. Jim is at the moment on the floor here at the KLOS studio. We have placed some microphones uh, alongside the gong, one in front of it, one behind it. If you have stereo, you should hear uh, perhaps the initial sound through one channel and the reverberation through the other. Um, Jim, th the radio station is yours. What would you like to do? Well, let's see uh, what happens. I don't know uh, really what's going to happen here, but this is... Uh this is a concert gong, and it's generally uh, it's generally struck like this. I can hear all of that sound that's going on inside there, but I only have one mallet here, and it's quite a large uh, uh, gong striker, and. Uh, We'll see what can happen here. Maybe we can get something going. Is everything cool? Yeah, just go ahead. Oh, I, I see. Uh, <laughs> next door they're doing the ABC Network News. And 
I think we were just reaching <laughs> Chicago. Uh. <laughs> Chad didn't know it went through the wall. I hadn't. Uh, let's do it again. How long does it resonate, Jim? When I mean, when you strike it once, what uh, what is the usual time that that some sound emits from the gong? You mean the duration of the uh, the duration of uh, yeah uh, of the echo? I don't know. You want to hear? It? You want to try? Yeah, uh, not too loud, so we don't no, bug no, the neighbors. No. I mean, it doesn't it's about the same. just a little over 30 seconds. It's still humming. Yeah, it's got a great song. I mean, uh, why don't you try it? Okay, let me get down there. Let me take the earphones out. Let me get near a microphone. There is... You can be on those microphones, uh, Jim, up there. Okay. Again, I assume that there is no way to do this, that you just... You just do it. I mean, you just hit it and you play the thing as it happens all right if you have two hands going you know I was trying to play with my fingers but it uh, yeah how did you is it a question of tapping it with your fingertips yeah just uh, yeah try it okay. with the fingers see what happens with it. first I want to hit it I have a okay. desire yeah. to <laughs> strike it everybody does uh, you you said on one of the late night talk shows that some people regard it as being something ominous and just yeah. attempt to avoid it but yeah I feel like striking it yeah, well, they, they, everyone seems to approach the gong a little differently. I, some people like to, uh, you know, go up and strike it with uh, all their, with a lot of vengeance and hostility and so on. And then they, they get softer. And then those that come to it very lightly and toy around with it like it's going to bite them or something, eventually get very free and confident and end up playing really loud. And I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> I feel like a little kid. Let me uh, steer this. The gong. really nice. Hit it once. You didn't really hit it. Hit it right here. Just below the... Uh, With the mallet? Yeah. Now, would you 
determined to strike it once with a big one to kind of get it going, get the motor of it. Okay, let me stop it again. It's interesting, tactily, to touch it yeah, while it's it vibrating, because right. it really feels like, ah, I know what it feels like. It feels, uh, Barney, Louise, you should touch it too. It feels like it's alive. It is alive. Uh, uh, but I mean, it really feels like it's alive. It feels like uh, a human being. Touch it, wait till I tap it, and then you can touch it. And I'll give it a pretty good one. See if we can reach New Orleans. Don't hit the center, though. Hit just a little off center. Now we should try it without touching it, because that stops it from, from gonging it. But isn't that the effect that it creates? Oh, yeah. See what builds up to the thing? Soar. I wish everyone had a gong, because it's... Uh, it's so much fun. It really is. Uh, I mean, like, uh, would would you like to have a gong in your apartment? Or uh, I I don't think uh, Manny's equipment rental is going to get this one back. <laughs> we'll take a break, and we'll be right back with James Coburn and the gong. I thought it might be interesting now that we have familiarized ourselves somewhat with the gong, and I'm and I'm sure for many of you, as is the case for myself. This is a, a very yeah. unique experience, just a delightful thing. We've already had a dozen telephone calls from people wanting to know where to get them, where to buy them, where to rent them, and the like. Uh, I think I'm going to have to go out and get one myself. Okay, let's do this. I thought we would take, um, oh, I don't know, five or ten minutes or, or five hours or two seconds or whatever it takes. And I'm just going to let Jim uh, do whatever he cares to do uh, with the gong. And we'll all be quiet here, or we'll chant, if uh, so be the case. And you at home, perhaps, right now. If you really want to participate in this experience or experiment, you might dim the lights in your house or perhaps light a candle, and close your eyes, and just see where it takes you. See where you go with it. Let's do it. We give it. We give it. I will. I'm watching. After I might actually net and also
mature, that maybe, and done by this doctor's right at the center. I hate to do that sometimes when people call it. Barney, could you go inside and take that call? Somebody is with KVAN radio in Portland, Oregon, who says he's hearing us. So I, <laughs> I think that that should be tracked down. We go by cable, apparently, to Yuma, Arizona, but I didn't know we were in Portland. Uh, for those of you who were just joining us, who, who picked up KLOS during the last 15 minutes, what you heard was... Uh, just an extraordinary, extraordinary experience with a gong uh, performed for us live here by James Coburn. I, and, and during the, uh, the last cut of, of music, I was just relating to, you, to Jim how absolutely incredible that was. I mean, that was just such a, an, an immaculate high. I can't... Does that do for you what it's done for everybody in this room? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, like... I don't know, I just really feel energized now. It is somehow it uh, shatters all the negative vibrations that go around you and uh, uh, lets in some kind of, some purity of something or other. And it, uh, I really get very high playing those things. I feel stoned out behind yeah. it. I mean, just so slowed down and laid back. It's, and I've, I've never had that experience off of a musical instrument. And I'm trying, even though I shouldn't intellectualize or verbalize the experience, I'm trying to understand why that has just done it for me more than any guitar, sitar, organ, uh, clarinet, uh, whatever. Why that? Have you ever figured... I think it's because it's probably the, as pure uh, an instrument as you can... It, it requires no technique at all to play. It just is a song that it's in it. Uh, that Those Germans that... Uh, uh, got the formula that locked somewhere inside there is somebody that really wants to sing I don't know I don't know what it is it's just uh, I mean I, I, I feel the same way you I can't explain it I just uh, I like the experience of it and I wish that more people would uh, get gongs and have get their gong off <laughs> <laughs> I think we've moved about a hundred gongs and I can't Thank you enough for being with us tonight. This has just been one of the, the most joyous evenings we've spent here at KLOS, and I thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Elliot. I've enjoyed it, too. I mean, any time I can go anyplace and play the gong, you know, it's going to be a good time for me. <laughs> a Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 